Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church this morning. And if you're watching online, greetings to you today as well. The announcements this week are that services continue at Beechwood this week on Monday and Wednesday, so we continue to pray and support the work there. Bible studies are on Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. and 7 p.m., and you can join the evening Bible study by Zoom if that helps you. There are still some free uh, second-hand books down in the church hall, so if you've not had a look through uh, the books that are down there, today would be a good day to do so. We have our annual congregational meeting tomorrow night, so that's Monday night at 7 p.m. here at church, so please do come along tomorrow night for our ACM at 7 p.m. Next Friday is uh, Good Friday, and so we have a church service here at 9 a.m. for Good Friday, and then of course next Sunday is Easter Sunday. Looking ahead to the 5th of April, we have our next King's Kids, so that's a Friday afternoon for King's Kids this time, King's Kids on the 5th of April, followed by Kids King's Youth, getting good at our tongue twisters here, and so that's going to be on the 5th of April, something to have in your diaries. And while your diary's open, we also have our church uh, family day coming up. So that's the 13th of April out at uh, Campbelltown Presbyterian Church as the venue. And uh, David McDougall will be uh, our speaker this year. It's a small cost, $10 per adult just to cover food. And if you could please uh, sign up on the sign-up sheet in the lobby, that would be great. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, again, with the uh, church family day, if you do sign up and you do want to pay ahead of the day, uh, which is indeed preferable, uh, feel free to just write your name on an envelope, write what it's for and put that into the offertory or there is uh, a bag outside the doors there. Just feel free to drop your money in there and just make sure you sign off on the sheet that you have paid. Uh, but yeah, I encourage you to be signing up and joining us for that day. It'd be great to hear from David McDougall as he opens God's word to us. As we come together today to worship the Lord, I want to begin by reading to us from Psalm 8 and the opening two verses. It's a psalm of David. He writes, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Indeed, the God that we come before this day is the God who has made heaven and earth, the God who is above all and in all and through all, and to him is glory and honour due. So we're going to stand together and sing his praises this day <clears throat> as we sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Please stand and we'll sing.
We've been slowly making our way through the Westminster Shorter Catechism and a couple of weeks ago we arrived at question 21, who is the redeemer of God's elect? Uh, last time as we were considering this question we considered what a redeemer is and how it is indeed that, that Christ redeems us, that Christ purchases back, uh, makes us to be God's once more. Uh, this week however, I want to look at the, the other part of that question and answer. So again, let me ask, and if we can answer together, who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being the eternal Son of God, became man and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Uh, it's important that we consider the other part of this uh, question and response today because having discussed Jesus as the Redeemer, we need to consider how it is indeed that he can fulfil the role of a Redeemer. And it is this simple fact that is uh, spelled out for us in this answer, that Jesus is himself perfectly man and perfectly God, that he is both God and man in one. It's that old biblical mass again where we get one plus one equals one uh, he is a hundred percent god he is a hundred percent man he is a hundred percent one he is both divine and human and so it is that christ has lived the life that we could not that christ has walked the path that we have failed to tread that he has walked in obedience before the lord that he has kept his holy commands that he has been obedient to god even to the point of death. And yet death is not a consequence for his life, but for our own. It's for our sins that he went to the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for our sins, to redeem us, to buy us back as God's own. But because he's also divine, because he is also God, death has no power over him. In fact, he defeats death. He rises again from the dead. And he ascends to heaven where he promises to return once more as he comes to take a people to be his own. It's an interesting fact, actually, as you consider the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, here's, a, here's a thought that may not have occurred to you before, but uh, it is the Son of God who is indeed eternal. That Jesus himself came to be that the Son of God was from the beginning. But then in the incarnation, we have Jesus come into the world. But that Jesus, having become a man, the Son of God having become a man, having taken on human flesh, having become Jesus, who is the Christ, goes on to now be eternal. The Son of God remains eternal, but he remains now in this physical form that we have this one who continues to be both God and man, but now forever. And so as the God-man, the eternal God-man, he represents both us and God. He can stand between us and God. He can present us right before God. He can redeem us and make us his own. The reason that Christ needs, however, to make redemption for us is because there's a price that we cannot pay. Because we owe our own lives as the wages of our sin is indeed death. And so as we consider these words from the 21st question of the Shorter Catechism, I want to take a moment now to, to pray and to confess our sins, to recognise uh, the redeeming work of Christ and its necessity for us. So let's pray. Now, Father, we do... Indeed, come before you this day with thanksgiving and rejoicing that you have sent your Son into this world, that he has taken upon himself human flesh, that he has gone to the cross of Calvary in order to take upon himself the sins of many. Father, we give you thanks that you have seen fit through his blood to pay the price that we could not. And yet, Father, we acknowledge that even as we seek to walk in your ways, to be pleasing in your sight, uh, we fail, we sin, 
and we fall. Father, forgive us, we pray. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Create within us clean hearts and restore steadfast spirits. Now grant to us the joy once more of knowing salvation in Christ Jesus and to remember all that he has done and continues to do. Help us to walk and to live by faith and by the power of your spirit that we might be equipped and encouraged day by day to live lives pleasing to you and help us to know the joy of our sins forgiven as we entrust them to you. For we ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we consider those words, I just want to read to you from Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 22 to 25. The writer says, uh, This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. We have one who now lives forever, can stand as a priest forever to make intercession for us forever. And so we ought to give praise and thanks to that one who indeed uh, stands before God, who makes the way for us to come before God, righteous and unstained. Let's stand together as we sing once more of his love, of his salvation to us. My song is Love Unknown.
open God's word together and turn to Psalm 118. I will give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. <coughs> Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. I will give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Amen. May I be waited on for our free will offerings. pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to come together and to worship you again this week. And we thank you for the, the fellowship that we know here. We thank you for the way that you bless us and provide for us. You meet our every need. And Father, we bring this portion back uh, this week. We thank you that we can worship you in this way. We ask that these funds would be used wisely in the name of King Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Look to the New Testament and we'll read from Matthew 21, verses 1 to 17. From Matthew 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. 
This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, put on them the, their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. This is God's word. Amen. Thanks, Pete. We'll come before the Lord in prayer now. Just a few things to draw to your attention as we do come to pray. Uh, Obviously very uh, sad to hear through the week that Harriet's uh, surgery had to be postponed uh, once more. Uh, the next date that Harriet has been given uh, is the 2nd of April, which is the Tuesday just after Easter. So do be praying for her. Uh, the first time she had a call the day before to say don't come in. Uh, last time she went all the way in and spent the whole day there and came home again. Uh, we can pray that she goes one step further. That will hopefully mean she actually has the surgery done. Uh, and to be praying for uh, that process and her recovery, of course, in all of that as well. Uh, good to see Charlie here as well this week. We we're praying for Charlie after he broke his arm last week. Uh, to continue to pray for him and Sam's about to get his cast off, Lord willing. Uh, so we can pray for both of them this morning. Uh, it was good to hear also from Don was sharing earlier this morning that Will was able to actually get out, get out to the Easter show of all things uh, yesterday. Uh, so uh, Will's been in uh, much better spirits of late and getting that little bit of extra mobility and help uh, which has been wonderful so do continue to be praying for uh, Will uh, so many things I want to mention here the other thing I think I really need to talk about is just the big week we've had in government uh, if you've been paying attention to the news through the course of this week uh, first there was at the federal level uh, the uh, recommendations that were made regarding religious education, discrimination in religious schools. Uh, the recommendations are quite severe. Uh, if you read through the document, which I don't encourage you to do, it's hundreds of pages of garbage, but uh, the document in brief says that basically religious schools should have no greater freedom than anyone else, uh, that we shouldn't be able to discriminate uh, on, the case, on the basis of uh, sex or gender or orientation. Uh, whatever it may be, uh, and really if these things are put into force it will be interesting to see uh, how the law is then applied, uh, particularly in our Christian schools. Uh, the other thing uh, along the same lines is the gay conversion therapy that was actually introduced uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, this won't come into effect until this time next year, uh, but again, effectively there was a, a long night of debate around this bill. Uh, the reason there was a lot of debate was because there were many amendments being proposed and they were all struck down. Uh, the bill ended up uh, proceeding unchanged. And that bill really, again, makes it very difficult uh, for Christians to offer any sort of support or care to anyone who might be struggling with gender confusion, identity, uh, to, to pray for someone in that situation, to a minister of the gospel to them uh, may indeed become illegal. Again, will be this will be a test of law come next March. Uh, maybe I'll do a short sermon series uh, in March and see what happens. Uh, 
Um, but it is going to be a, a very interesting test. At, at the moment, the wording of the legislation that's come through effectively says that if I want to say that homosexuality is a sin, that I need to frame it in such a way as to say, our faith teaches that homosexuality is a sin. Now, there might be some truth to that, but I just want to simply say right now, the Bible says, God says, it is true that homosexuality is a sin, as are many other things. And it's a sad day when we can't actually call sin, sin. So we do want to be praying for our government, praying for the application of these laws, praying for all who will be affected by them. Uh, there's going to be many people who are confused and are struggling with this sort of thing and can't get answers as a result. Uh, so we do want to be praying for all of those. Uh, as I say, many other things to be praying for, but let's come now before the Lord in prayer. Uh, most merciful God, we, uh, we do indeed want to give you thanks that you are the God who is over all, that you rule over all, that you sustain all things, and by your word, all things hold together. We thank you, therefore, that though uh, our governments, our laws can change, that they can follow the whims of people, that you are an unchanging God, and that you continue to rule and reign sovereignly over all. We thank you that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ Jesus, our Lord, that indeed we can look forward to his coming again and a day in which we will come under his lordship for all eternity. But Father, we pray until that day that you would continue to grant grace to your people, that you would sustain us, that you would help us as we seek to submit ourselves to the rule of law, to those that you've placed over us, but as we seek above all else to bring glory and honour to you. Father, we pray even at this late stage, that with regard to these uh, bills and reports that have been presented before varying levels of government, that these things may be overturned, uh, that uh, these rules might be set aside, that there might continue to be freedom for your people and freedom to make the name of Christ known. We pray that there would be no barrier to communicating the gospel of grace and love that is in Christ Jesus. And Lord, that even where barriers exist, that you would give us a faithfulness and a boldness to tear them down, to continue to faithfully proclaim your truth, knowing that it is only the only truth and the only thing that can save us. Father, as we come to you this day, we do want to bring before you also the many amongst our number who have been uh, sick, who have been struggling with uh, illness, uh, with infirmity, we pray for Harriet. We are saddened that her surgery had to be postponed once more and we do pray that it would be able to go ahead on the second as is now planned. We pray that it would be bringing about the desired result, that it would stop the deterioration that she's seeing and indeed that it might even bring greater healing. And we pray that you would do what a surgeon could not, that you would be restoring her body and that you would be giving strength to her spirit. Father, we do uh, pray too for our brother Will. We thank you for the encouragements he's had of late, that he's been able to get out and uh, for the, the many you've provided around him and for the, the generous, loving care that they have given. Father, we thank you uh, that we can bring him before you in prayer and do ask that you would continue to draw near to him, that you would help him to be an ambassador of your grace, uh, that even in his difficulties he might uh, speak a word in season, and that through him others may come to know and love you. We pray too this morning for uh, young Charlie and Sam. Uh, we pray for their uh, recovery and healing. Pray that Sam would be able to have his cast removed, that his uh, arm might have full mobility once more, that he gives strength to him. We pray for Charlie that he would not be uh, irritated or frustrated, uh, and Lord, that you would sustain him through the weeks ahead. Now we ask for any others amongst our number, Lord, who... Uh, may be sick or, or struggling at this time, whether known to us or unknown. We thank you that you are a God who knows all. And we pray that you would be near to each one, to give them strength, give them comfort and give them peace. Now, Father, we thank you too for the joy of being able to uh, bring others to you in prayer, to be able to pray for those that we love and minister to and those that we would uh, desire to uh, come to know you 
and to know the saving grace of Christ Jesus. Uh, we do pray for Steve's friend Bob uh, in particular, Lord, that you would continue to uh, be near to him in his distress, that he might call upon you and that you would be uh, the God of uh, comfort, of refuge and salvation to him. We pray that you would place the right people in his life to minister your gospel. Uh, Lord, that uh, in his uh, time of darkness, that he might see the light. And Lord, that that light would be life and godliness to him. Our Father, we pray uh, indeed for all of those that we would seek to minister to, that you would give grace to your people as we speak your truth in love. And Lord, that you would open hearts to uh, hear and receive and respond to your word. And Lord, that many more might uh, call upon the name of Christ and be saved. Father, we thank you too for uh, the film viewing on Friday night and for the, the work that Hope House continue to engage in, in offering care and support for uh, unexpected pregnancies or difficult pregnancies. And Father, we thank you for the, the mothers, fathers and even children who are helped through this work and we pray that you continue to strengthen and support them in this important endeavour. Help us to continue to uh, recognise the sanctity of life to value every life that you have given and to uh, speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, again be at work uh, within our government to overturn uh, such laws and legislation that would make things like uh, abortion legal and so freely available. Uh, Father, we pray indeed that you would preserve life and, Lord, that you would uh, grant through the message of grace, life everlasting. Father, again, we just thank you for this day, for the opportunity to, to worship you, to sing your praises and to come under your word. And we pray that you would continue to minister to each one, that you would draw near to us and grant us strength, grant us rejoicing, that we might indeed go forth from this place having been fed and nourished and equipped to love and to serve you. For we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand once more and sing as we prepare to come to God's word. We'll be looking at Christ's triumphal entry in Matthew 21 in a moment. And so uh, let's stand together and sing these words of Henry Hart Millman, Ride on, ride on in majesty. Thank you. 
Well, let's pray once more as we come to God's word. Father, we thank you now that we can open your word, uh, that revelation by which you speak to us through the power of your spirit. And we ask, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts, uh, give us ears to hear, and give us eyes to see and hearts to understand, to comprehend and to rejoice in what you would speak to us this day. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we approach Easter next week, I thought this was a good opportunity to, uh, to look at this Easter narrative, uh, to consider this week Christ's triumphal entry before we come to his death on Easter Friday. And then Resurrection Sunday, we'll be looking at his resurrection in the morning uh, before in the evening we actually consider his ascension to heaven. Uh, I, I do need to offer a word of apology before I begin this morning. I did print the wrong outline this morning. Uh, there's nothing in your outline, uh, so you'll need to pay even closer attention. If you've got a pen, and pen there, you might want to jot down these points as I uh, <laughs> recite them to you. Hopefully my technology works and I can read this off my phone here. Uh, but our focus today is really going to be on uh, Christ's entry into Jerusalem, his preparation for his crucifixion, which is really what is taking place here. Uh, God is... Uh, preparing Jesus. Jesus is preparing himself and preparing the people for what is about to unfold. And what we're actually going to see as we consider this this morning is the great wisdom and foreknowledge of God and actually the the lack of wisdom and understanding and comprehension that we have. As we're reading through this, we'll see here today how Jesus has a great understanding of what is about to unfold and so every choice he makes every step along the way is clearly and carefully mapped out to tell a story to help the people to understand who he is and why he has come and what he is to do and yet as we consider the response of the people we'll see that there is some understanding but that it is mixed uh, that there is indeed actually contradictory things that take place in the response of the people as they wrestle with what they are seeing and struggling to comprehend. All of this gives us an insight as to what is actually going to unfold when Jesus finally comes to that cross, what the response of the people might be, what the response might be when he rises again, when he ascends to heaven, uh, what the response of people might be to even today as we help them to see who Christ is, what he has made known. This sort of uh, confusion, misunderstanding, misapplication of what these things mean. Uh, so the first thing I, I want to consider then today as we come to this is, as I said, the great wisdom and foreknowledge of God uh, that is shown in Christ Jesus. Uh, let me read again the opening verses of Matthew chapter 21. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. As you read those opening words, we get uh, here in a manner of speaking a miracle take place as we see the foreknowledge of Christ. Uh, that he sends his disciples on to go and retrieve for him this colt upon which he will ride into Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus knows where they're going to find it. He knows what the response of the owner of this colt or this donkey will be. Uh, he knows what they need to say, how they need to uh, make Christ known to this man. Actually, it's interesting that some of the more liberal commentators here want to suggest that uh, Jesus had actually planned this ahead. Uh, that actually we don't have evidence here that Jesus knew what was going to happen. What we have is evidence here that Jesus had already gone and spoken to someone, that he had made arrangements 
and that he was simply giving instructions to his disciples that they might follow them through. The interesting thing is that even if we were to read it that way, consider what it is that Jesus says. In verse 3, he says to these men, if, any, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Even if Jesus has gone on ahead to speak to this man to prepare these beasts, as it were, for his arrival, it would seem that Jesus has managed to convince this man that he is Lord. It seemed that Jesus has done something already quite miraculous in revealing himself, making himself known. Now, I don't think that is what Jesus has done here, uh, but it's simply to say that even these sorts of arguments really become futile at this point. Because we see Christ is making himself known. Christ is Lord and it is the Lord who has need of these things. But for what reason? Verse 4 tells us this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Uh, the prophet there that's being spoken of is Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, where Zechariah prophesies that the king will come riding on a colt, riding on this beast of burden. Jesus has made deliberate plans, arrangements that he might ride into Jerusalem at this time in a way that is in keeping with the prophecies of Zechariah. Now note for a moment, note for a moment how this compares with what Jesus' ministry has been up until this point. Consider, if you would, how many times we've heard Jesus say to people, tell no one of what you have seen here. Tell no one, speak nothing of what has been done. Uh, keep these things to yourself. These things must remain hidden. How often has Christ worked to conceal what he has done, to play down the events as they've unfolded? And yet here... Jesus says it's time. People need to know that this is prophecy being fulfilled. It's interesting because given the context of Matthew chapter 20, Jesus has been speaking to his disciples and speaking of his death. We go back to Matthew chapter 20 verse 17. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Jesus has just told them the purpose for which he is going to Jerusalem is that he might die. But he doesn't sneak in. As he's approaching Jerusalem, he makes preparations that people will see him. He puts on a parade, he puts on a show, as it were, that people might see the prophecies being fulfilled. And so we're told that the disciples do as Jesus asks. They go and they, they gather these beasts of burden. Uh, you, you may note that uh, in uh, the other accounts in Mark and Luke. Uh, there's only one donkey that is presented there. Uh, the, the indication seems to be that there is a mother and her baby, this cult. Uh, this cult, we're told in Mark, that has never been ridden upon. And so it makes sense that the mother would come with the cult, but then Jesus rides upon this cult. Uh, there, there's an innocence in what is taking place. Uh, by this point in history, it was common that they would be riding upon a horse or even a camel. A donkey was a beast of burden. Uh, though he is mounted as he enters in, there's something kingly in that procession. There's also something humble in what Jesus is partaking in. As he rides upon this donkey, as he enters in to Jerusalem, as he comes making this triumphal entry, it's indeed a great triumph because it is a demonstration to the people of Israel that their king is here. 
that the king has come, the one they've been waiting for, the one who has been prophesied of of old, has now come to be with his people. Indeed, it would be harder for Jesus to have done this in a, a much more dramatic way than what he does here. And we see, don't we, some understanding from the people. Uh, But this is the second thing I want us to note this morning, that understanding and wisdom are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, That there There is a greater knowledge, a greater understanding, a greater wisdom that must come as we see the truth presented to us. From verse 6, we're told that the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. There's many things uh, taking place in this event, isn't it? Uh, Firstly, we see these crowds gathered as Jesus uh, comes into the city, as he uh, approaches Jerusalem. He's riding upon a donkey and they start to uh, gather uh, palm leaves. This is uh, Palm Sunday. They start to gather these leaves and lay them before him. They they, uh, lay out the branches, they lay out their cloaks on the road. They, They create a path, as it were. This is the red carpet being rolled out for the king. Indeed, this is a kingly procession. If we look back to the Old Testament picture that's been created for us here, it's actually the picture of a king having won his victory. This is how he is welcomed back amongst his people. They come out and they lay their cloaks before him. They lay down these branches before him. They make a pathway that he can tread as he comes in to declare his victory over their enemies. And indeed, Christ is doing that. Even before he reaches the cross, Christ is coming in, he's declaring victory. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the enemy. But at the same time, notice what the people are saying. Their actions are declaring him to be victorious, but their words are asking for something. They they shout, Hosanna to the son of David. That word, Hosanna, is save us. It's a cry for deliverance. Uh, They're calling out to this man as he enters into the city that he might deliver them. Indeed, Jesus does come to deliver them, doesn't he? Jesus comes to Jerusalem to deliver us all from sin and death. To deliver us from the punishment that he's going to take upon himself. But is that what the people have in mind? As the people are crying out for deliverance, uh, perhaps it is that that some of them do look upon this one and recognise their need for deliverance from their own sin, from their own rebellion, their own turning away from God. But no doubt for many, as they're crying out for salvation, as they're crying out that this one would rescue them, that he would save them, that their focus is upon him as king. That they're looking for a king of their own. One who would rule and reign. One who would drive out the oppressive nations who have taken over. One who would indeed lead the people. Who would re-establish Israel to its former glory. We sang before, my song is love unknown. I think verse 3 really speaks to this. Uh, Sometimes Sometimes they crowd his way and his sweet praises sing. Resounding all the day, hosannas to their king. Then crucify is all their bread. And for his death they thirst and cry. This indeed is the nature of the people that we see. 
that we're going to see many of those who are laying out their cloaks, laying out these branches before Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem, are likewise going to be those who stand before the cross only a week later. Who are baying for his life, who are crying out that he might die. There is some acknowledgement, some understanding of who this person might be, but not a complete understanding, isn't there? Again, we see it in verse 10, when people begin to ask, who is this? It's a question that Luke asks right throughout his gospel. Who is this man? And throughout the gospel of Luke, we're told time and again that this man is the son of God. This man is the Messiah. This one is the one who has come to rescue us, to save us from our sins. But the response as the crowd sees this man is he says, this is Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee, a prophet. Again, no doubt Christ is a prophet. He is one who speaks the word of God, who communicates God's word, his purpose to his people. But he's far more than that, isn't he? If they truly understood the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, if they truly understood the words that they had been crying out, uh, words uh, that we see, for example, in Psalm 118, as we were reading earlier, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they would understand that this is the Messiah, the promised one, the one who has come to set God's people free, to restore them as God's people. The problem is, how is he going to do it? Jesus has already forewarned the disciples, it'll be through his death. And Jesus actually gives even greater indication of what his purpose is in the acts that follow in verses 12 to 17. This is the final point that we have there this morning. Uh, in verses 12 to 17, we'll see that uh, Christ comes... Uh, preparing a house for himself. In verses 12 to 17, we have this activity of the cleansing of the temple. From verse 12, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. It is an important point to note that in each of the synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, in every occasion where Jesus enters into Jerusalem, his first act is to go into the temple and to drive out these money changers, is to cleanse the temple. If we look at the history of Israel, the history of of the temple, you'll see that the temple is constructed as a dwelling place for God amongst his people. A place where God would meet with his people. A place where the priest could go to make intercession, to offer up sacrifices. When the tabernacle was constructed in the wilderness, a cloud descended upon it. God came to rest in that place and Moses and Joshua would go in to meet with him. When the temple was finally built in Jerusalem, again, a cloud descended upon it. The presence of God came into that temple where the priests could go in to meet. Uh, when the temple was destroyed and rebuilt, uh, when we see Israel coming up out of the exile, when we read through Ezra and Nehemiah and the walls are reconstructed, when the temple is put in place once more, the people worship again and they give praise to God that his dwelling place is now amongst them, but the cloud does not descend. Something is missing. 
they're still waiting for that moment that God manifests himself, God makes himself present, comes into the temple, returns. And then as we come to Matthew chapter 21, as we come to this triumphal entry, what do we have? We have God coming into his temple once more. But the temple he comes into is not the temple that he's looking for. This temple is one that has been corrupted, one that needs to be cleansed, one that needs to be rid of. In fact, as the people watching Christ come in, their expectation is that he's going to drive out the Roman authorities. But it's the religious Jews that Christ rails against. Christ comes and drives out his people from the temple, declaring to them that his house is to be called a house of prayer, but they have indeed made it a den of robbers. This act, this act of cleansing, of purification, is a foreshadowing to us of what Christ intends to do for us. That the, the triumphal entry becomes a picture to us of the triumph of Christ through his crucifixion, that by his spirit he comes to dwell in the house of his people. That he cleanses us, that he makes us new. That he takes up a dwelling within us. Indeed, in John's gospel, uh, there is some debate as to how many times this event occurs, but the cleansing of the temple that's recounted in John's Gospel is actually right at the beginning of John's Gospel. It follows hot on the heels of the wedding at Cana, the first miracle, where Jesus reveals himself to be the Messiah, and hot on the heels of John chapter 1, where Jesus is made known to us as the Word made flesh, the revelation of God, the one who has come into the world to tabernacle, to dwell, to be in that tent of his people. Christ's entry at this point foreshadows his entry into us, his preparation of us. But it also shows the idolatry, the false worship that the people have actually entered into. It shows how lost these people are, how desperately in need of Christ they are. They're not desperately in need of a, a king simply to rule over them, to throw out their oppressors. But they need one who's going to cleanse them from the inside. Who's going to make their own hearts known to them. Who's going to drive out that wickedness and make his dwelling among them. Friends, as we consider this passage this morning, as we look forward this week to the celebration of Easter, to rejoicing in what Christ has done for us, that he has gone to the cross at Calvary to make atonement for sin, that he has died in the place of sinners, that he has risen again, conquering sin and death, that he has ascended to the right hand of the throne of God and that indeed he promises that he will come once more. <clears throat> we need to consider this. Who is this? Who is this man? Is he merely a prophet? Is he merely a conquering king? Is he merely one who would do away with religion and oppression? Or is he all these things and more? Our cry ought to be, Hosanna to the son of David. Save us, everlasting king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And indeed, our blessing is to those who would come in his name. God knows all things. 
He demonstrates his wisdom, his knowledge, his insight, his foreknowledge through these activities of Christ. And Christ reveals himself here in a very particular way that he hasn't up until this point. But he reveals himself so that we will know when he goes to the cross of Calvary that this is his purpose. That he does this for us. That his death is in our place. And that all who believe in him will indeed not perish, but have everlasting life through him. Friends, I want to encourage you this morning, if you don't know who this Jesus is, ask that he might come into your heart, that he might indeed cleanse out the wickedness, the false idols, that he might set those things aside, that he might indeed be to you King, Lord and Saviour evermore. Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for this uh, marvellous recounting of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, of the triumph of his grace as he went to the cross of Calvary, of the a triumph over sin as he paid the price for sin that we could not. We give you thanks for his triumph over death as he rose again from the dead and his ascension to heaven. We give you thanks that he is the king everlasting who rules and reigns over all and that he indeed will return one day to rule and to reign for eternity. Help us to rejoice in these things. Help us as we look forward to this Easter to remember what he has done, to remember your divine purposes, to entrust ourselves to you, to recognise that though we do not fully understand these things, though we, we struggle to grasp and comprehend at times, that you are the God who knows all, who is wisdom everlasting, and indeed who has uh, so acted for the good of his people, that we might have life and godliness in him, who is indeed our King and Saviour. For it's in his name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. As we consider those words, we'll stand and sing once more our closing hymn this morning. O to see the dawn, the power of the cross.
we close with these words from 2 Thessalonians. Friends, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Yeah.